This is Startup to Storefront, and this is a very different episode from what we normally cover. On this show, we've covered the highs and lows of dozens of entrepreneurs' journeys, and part of every one of those journeys takes them down the path of self-discovery, a path that challenges them and expands their worldview before transforming them into the successful business owners and operators they are today. But what happens if that path to self-discovery initially drags you down into some of the most hateful and violent places in humanity? One where fear, hatred, and self-loathing rule and lead to violent extremism. To be fair, this is not a typical path. And this is not one that any rational person would ever consider. But this path does exist, and all it takes is to read the news to know that it persists in the shadows of modern society. So we believe that it makes sense to shine a light on it and expose it for what it is in the hopes of reforming those who are currently embedded within the rank and file of hate groups. Because there is hope for those who at first glance might seem beyond redemption. And to find that hope, you need look no further than today's guest, Arno Michaelis. Arno is a former leader of a white nationalist group who from the late 80s to the early 90s was involved in all sorts of violent acts against minorities, the LGBT community, and any white person he and his organization deemed to be unsupportive of his cause. The hatred and violence ran so deep that he even tried to take his own life with two different suicide attempts. He saw friends killed, more go to prison, and he hurt innocent people, himself, and his family all because he bought into a notion where he believed there would be a race war and that he was carrying out these acts because in doing so, he was defending his race. At the very core of white nationalism exists the lie that the Aryan race is the superior race. But pull at any corner of this lie and it starts to unravel. For Arno, this lie was undone by the kindness and forgiveness shown to him by people he professed to hate. This coupled with the birth of his daughter, led him to flee the life of violence and hatred he had inhabited. Once removed, he was faced with a choice, bury his past or make amends for it. It is to our society's benefit that he chose the latter and is now a renowned author, speaker, and peacemaker actively working against violent extremists. Through his work, he has helped families reclaim loved ones who had joined hate groups and prevented countless others from believing in the narrative that they preach. His most recent book is called The Gift of Our Wounds, written alongside Pardeep Kaleka, whose father was killed in the Sikh temple shooting in 2012 by a white supremacist. A fascinating book that I cannot recommend highly enough. It formed the basis of our conversation today, ranging from how music played an important role in both Arno's entrance and exit from white nationalism, how hate groups recruit and how best to counteract them, and how Arno found happiness and forgiveness in the healing process that he's currently going through and will continue to go through for the rest of his life. So without any further ado, here is our conversation with Arno Michaelis. Let's jump into it. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast on today's show. I don't even know how to honestly introduce you, Arno fucking amazing book, crazy story. I think one of the things, just to dig into some of your past, it sounds like there was a pivotal moment, at least in reading the book, where you get jumped, right, by a bunch of guys, nobody else jumps in, and this becomes like a defining moment for you, where you felt probably alone, mega vulnerable, and this became like, let me lean into finding my group. Yeah, for sure. I want to dig into that, right? That, that to me was like, wow, like we can all relate to that. We've all been through high school. If you grew up in the 90s or the 80s, right? Pre-phone era, that, right. that was the thing. Like you were used to fighting. At least, at least where I grew up, fights were not a, it was like, oh, they're fighting again. Let's go. You know, right. It, it, was, right. it was a thing, but at the same time, it was also very polarizing, right? It was like, if you lost the fight, it could, it could ruin you for the next four years or at mm. the time of school. And so- when I heard you tell the story, it made a lot of sense to me. And I grew up in a place which was like probably a third black, a third Latino and a third white. And so okay. people were mixed all the time. But it was when these defining moments hit, c- certain groups would act differently. Things would change, mm. right? Tides would come and, and it was like, oh, now we understand who this person's becoming for the next foreseeable future. And so I, I wanna lean into that with you. I want you to kind of, if you can share us, 
bring that bring us into that moment, into that sure. moment of, and even that decision making process. What happened after? Well, as, as most uh, storytellers are, I'm a big fan of irony. And uh, one of the big ironies of my story is that prior to becoming a white nationalist skinhead, maybe three, four years prior, I was one of the first white kids, at least in my area, who like got into hip hop and started breakdancing and things like that. So I used to go to a now furniture store, but it used to be like a roller rink on Saturday nights with skate jams going and uh, Nucleus and uh, Africa Bambata and all these like old school, early 80s kind of proto hip hop uh, artists playing. And I was a break dancer and I, I hung out with like the five black kids who went to my school. I lived in a very predominantly white suburb. But all of us like taught ourselves to break dance by watching Beat Street and one of the richer dudes furnished basement and uh, just like <laughs> trying to copy the moves. And we got pretty good at it. And it got us a lot of attention. Uh, we performed at the school talent show in uh, I believe it was seventh grade. And of course, at that time in any young man's life, getting the attention of young ladies is always a, a big thing. And uh, because I was this like cool breakdancer guy, I, I had a lot of girls who liked me and they uh, and I'd like that, of course. And I don't know if you guys are anywhere near old enough to remember like the OG, like mid 80s breakdancer look. But for uh, the white guys in the mix and, and Latino guys as well, it's kind of harder to pull off when you have an Afro, but the having that rat tail hanging in the back that was like that was part of the look right yeah. so i had like kind of this buzz cut going that was actually kind of billy idol ish and uh one of my first girlfriends actually liked me because i looked like billy idol she said and i had the rat tail hanging down and it had been dipped in peroxide and it was a good six inch long rat tail and a bunch of the jocks in my school just about all of whom i i had been like good friends with at some point i i've always been and this has certainly been a blessing, really. I, I've always kind of navigated every click there was in school, like throughout my K-12 years. Um, I'd hang out with the nerds. I'd hang out with the the burnouts, with the jocks, with the preppy kids, with the, and with the punk rockers when that came along, the, the break dancers, what have you. But even though I knew all these guys, like they were all getting really sick of my shit. They, they didn't like that I got all this attention from the girls. And it, it's important to understand, like I, I was a dick. I, I was like this cocky asshole kid. And I, I wasn't really, uh, didn't really care about other people. I, I didn't, I just as soon like tank a friendship and beat somebody's ass if I, for the whim of it. Uh, than like really be loyal to friends that I had and uh, they'd rub people the wrong way, go figure. Uh, and, and I had been a bully since I was a little kid. So a lot of these guys who are now jocks and maybe were bullied by me in first, second, third grade. And I, I don't think any kid ever has this coming, but if, if anybody, you can make an argument that I, I did have it coming. And, and what happened was, was uh, one day at recess, I'm there with my fellow B-boys and uh, we had gotten our boombox confiscated uh, like the week before. So we're like beatboxing to give a beat so we can break. And as we're like very engulfed in doing that with a good chunk of, of girls looking on, all of a sudden, like we didn't notice, but there was a group of like 20, 30 jock kids that just like snuck up and then they jumped on me. And I fought for all I was worth, like a rabid Wolverine, but <laughs> it was, there was, I, you know, a ton of them and just one of me. And eventually they ended up snipping my tail off and then running off with it like a, a trophy. And I, I was like hysterically bawling. It, it, I, I, was, I felt violated. You know, I, I can't imagine what anybody who's been sexually assaulted goes through, but lucky for me, like this is about as close as I've come to being sexually assaulted in my life. And, and it, it had that same sense of violation. And uh, the other thing that really sucked was that as I was kind of getting my bearings and everybody had split, like my, my guys were all gone also. All my, my B-boy guys who I hung out with every Saturday and um, 
Uh, of course, when you're a suburban white kid and you're hanging around with the black guys and you actually go to like the black part of town and you're at the roller arena every Saturday night, I was all enamored with like gangs, like the black gangs. And I was, so I was kind of a wannabe gangbanger as well as this uh, breakdancer guy. And we kind of looked at our little breakdancing group as like a gang. Like we stuck up for each other. We looked out for each other. Certainly when we went out to Starlight every Saturday, it was like we, we stuck together. And uh, we sometimes would get in little mix-ups with other groups of kids there. But when this tail cutting incident happened, like all my guys were absolutely nowhere to be seen. And that, that sucked. Like I, I really, uh, I, I expected these guys to have my back. Um, the, the attack was totally unexpected, but when it, it, it just made it hurt more afterwards when I kind of looked around and saw that they weren't anywhere to be found. So I, I literally like sprinted the mile and a half to my house and like came in and just devastated in tears my mom said she'll never forget that day about how upset I was and how hurt I was. And looking back now, I think like she's more hurt about it still than I am. Sure. Like I'm looking back now, I'm like, I, I had it coming. You know, when, what comes around goes around. You want to live by the sword. You want to be a bully. You want to fuck with other kids. Like somebody's going to fuck with you at some point. And that's, that's how I look at it now. But back then, like it, it sucked and it, and it really hurt. And I think it did. It definitely made me meaner. Yeah. going forward and I was already pretty mean so it, it was it kind of made me take the meanness up a notch and and I, I might ask you some questions that you might think like there's just so much curiosity to your story right and and I've never had the opportunity to talk to someone who lived that life or played a character in, in your former life and so for sure. me even when entrepreneurs come on it's like it's it's the chance we get to understand their worldview uh the beautiful thing about your story is that perspective changes and yeah. everything, everything comes and we'll for sure touch on that. But like, there's so many just questions I have around how does someone, did you get recruited from that moment on? You know, what was that like? What was the recruiting process like? Was it something that just happened gradually over time? Can you give us a sense of what that was like for you? Yeah, I, I work in counter-violent extremism now and everybody talks about, you know, being radicalized, counter-radicalized, de-radicalized, whatever. Looking back at my story, I was definitely one of the, the category of being self-radicalized. Sure. I wasn't like approached by anyone, at least not at first. I, I do recall I was in, I think, eighth grade, which was after the tail cutting thing, when I really kind of like got a whiff of the power of a swastika to, to piss people off and to mm -hmm. repulse people. And it, it's important to understand that since I started lashing out at other kids at school, whatever, at a very young age, like kindergarten, first grade, it, it really crystallized for me as, as it was just about pissing people off. Like right. I wanted to repulse people. I wanted to make a scene. I wanted to like wreck all your shit. And <laughs> nothing does that like a swastika. You're not wrong about that. That's for sure, right? It's, right. Yeah, it's very polarizing. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and I wasn't ignorant as to why. I, like I had known about the Holocaust. I, I grew up with uh, some pretty close friends who were Jewish. I, I recall in sixth grade, I went to a ton of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and caused a lot of trouble at those, but just for the sake of causing trouble, like not just from an anti-Semitic place. But in eighth grade, there was a, a new kid who was a, a Russian Jew, and he was kind of you know, dumpy and nerdy looking. And I just decided like this kid's this is my new target. He's, he's going to get it. And so I would sit in class and my mom is an amazing artist. And she, I, I've been drawing since I was a little kid and I was I'm still not a bad artist myself, but when I was in class, I was really into comic books also. So I draw these big, like muscled up superhero guys, like the body of like, you know, Superman or Thor or whatever. And then the head would just be a big smiley face and then on his chest, like where Superman's S would go, there was a big swastika. And, and I, I didn't have a name for the guy, but like that was just the guy. And then I, I thought it would be clever to like draw him doing all kinds of horrible things to this kid. Like decapitating him, kicking him down a flight of stairs, whatever. Like So I basically make these little comics of the of swastika guy 
uh, victimizing the kid, who of course I drew a character of and made him a lot fatter and dorkier looking than he was. And then I just slipped these to him during, you know, English class or whatever and, and giggle. And I had, of course, I had a bunch of toadies who were all thought it was hilarious as well. And, uh, you know, the kid, like many kids, is kind of like, haha, trying to play it off. And ultimately, uh, one teacher who I actually really connected with, I had him in sixth grade and eighth grade. His name was Mr. Franzen. And I, I love Mr. Franzen because he cussed. Like, I, I was like, yeah, this is a teacher who cusses. That's cool. Like, I that connects me with him right away. And the other cool thing about Mr. Franzen was he was a Vietnam vet and he would like tell all these really fucked up, gory Vietnam stories. And we're just like, oh, <laughs> like, so I love Mr. Franzen. And after uh, these comics I was drawing got wind uh, to him, he, he took me aside after class and he's like, Arnie, what, what is up with this swastika bullshit? Like, you know better than that. And I was just like, what? Uh, what? I'm just kidding. I'm just having fun. And he's like, that's not fun. There's nothing fun about that. That's bullshit. Like, you're, you're better than that. And I, I expect you to quit doing that right now. And, and I did. But I, I didn't lose the, the, the thrill or that, that memory of, like, how powerful it was. And all I got to do is display this symbol and everybody loses their shit. And from that point, I got involved in punk rock, which I still love. And I always make a point of saying I, I never want to make it sound like punk is some kind of gateway drug to become a white power skinhead. But to me, punk was just about like breaking shit and pissing people off and very kind of like Sid Vicious style. Like, I don't give a fuck. Fuck you, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be disgusting. I'm going to be repulsive. And in the mid, late 80s, there was another kind of faction of punk that arose and, and they're actually pr more predominant in the punk scene now than ever and back then we called them peace punks and they were like very kind of social justice driven activist types and and they i remember i'm going to a punk show when i'm 15 and all these peace punks are like boycott coors beer they don't hire black people they're racist and like i didn't give a shit one way or another who coors hired or didn't hire but i hated the peace punks because to me, punk was about, like, breaking shit. It wasn't about caring about things. And they were, like, threatening everything I thought punk was. So I would go out and spend the extra, like, dollar or two. To me, at that point, Coors was like a premium beer. That I, I was all about quantity, not quality. <laughs> but just to piss off the peace punks, like, I'm going to spend an extra dollar or two to go get Coors beer. And I even got myself a Coors hat. And I, I was literally like sitting outside of a punk show, working on my second 12 pack of Coors in my Coors hat, like fucking with all the peace punks. When a fellow, another, a friend from the punk scene that I knew brought up a Walkman and put the cans on me and hit play to play me a, a white power skinhead band called Screwdriver. And when I heard that music, I was just like, oh, 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 like, where has this been all my life? And, and just like, like the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Right away, I'm just like, this is amazing. Like, this is what I'm all about. And that music told me that the reason I, I was violent and the reason I was hateful was because I was a white man fighting for his people against this evil Jewish conspiracy to kill all the white people on the planet Earth. And if I don't succeed, there won't be any white people left. And, and as ridiculous as I would hope that sounds to any thinking person, to 16-year-old Arno, that was like literally music to my ears. And that's how I got into it. That was, was through the music. And then you would go on to start your own group, right? And kind of really... Yeah. And have you always... I want to use this term interestingly, but have you... You've, you've always kind of been a leader, right? You've always kind of been the person pushing, whether it's you're just pushing the edge, pushing people to have a reaction, you're always leading in some example. And so for you to get into music and lead your own band, I would imagine was like the thing you were going to do anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've always had an ability to influence other people for good, bad, or very, very ugly. I think the first time it was, was when I was in like second grade and there was a kid on the bus I beat up by myself all the time and that got boring. So I got a group of like six other kids to beat him up. And he got hurt really bad. And that was like kind of at the time where I was like, I can control people. Like I can make them do what I want them to do. What was that like for you, that moment for you when you realized it? Like it was a rush. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it was it was a huge like sense of power. And and uh, I, I liked it. 
I, I wanted more of it. And did you, at that moment, you just went into, let's go full throttle into doing all the things that are in my head and getting other people to do it. Right. Yeah. It, it was, uh, I, I always kind of had my own crew around me or whatever in, in sixth grade, but a year before the tail cutting incident, my parents watched the news and always annoyed the shit out of me. And I'm like, turn the news off. I don't care about the news. But I, one night on the news, they're talking about Patty Hearst and the Symbi Symbi Symbi's Liberation Army. And I had no idea what any of this is about, but Liberation Army sounded really dope to me. Mm. I'm like, Liberation Army, yeah. So in sixth grade, you know, me and my crew, we were oppressed by the teachers because they would stop us from hurting all these other kids and like stealing their lunch money. And so we need a kids' liberation army. And I actually <laughs> started that group in sixth grade, which involved like again drawing pictures of teachers being decapitated. A lot of shit that, like, send a whole school into lockdown nowadays. But yeah. uh, back then, it just got me a week of in-school suspension, during which my guys went to a dentist office next door to the playground, and they stole the hubcaps off of Mercedes there just to let them know we weren't fucking around. And they were all apprehended trying to take the hubcaps home on the bus. <laughs> wow. Many parents were like, you're not hanging around with Arnie Michaelis anymore. <laughs> That kind of shit. When you were first getting introduced to the groups, is it like any other gang in the sense of like there's an initiation process, they have to know you're worthy or like you're proving yourself to them? Is there, what is that like? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of parallels between skinhead crews and, and gangs. I, I've worked quite a bit in gang prevention, intervention. I'm a huge fanboy of Homeboy Industries there in LA. Uh, my dear friend Hector Verdugo is uh, associate executive director there. So I, I'm pretty versed in like street gang prevention, intervention. And I, I think that the skinhead gangs definitely fall into that category. We would have told you we were not a gang because we're white yeah. men. And, uh, we, and when we didn't like fight over turf and, and we, uh, aside from like violence, we weren't really engaged in like criminal activities like selling drugs or prostitution, things like that. But just the, the mental, emotional, social dynamic was very gang-like. We started our own skinhead crew in Milwaukee. And there, there's a, to my knowledge, the first white power skinhead crew in the United States was in Chicago. They were called the Chicago Area Skinheads. And their leader went to prison right about the time that our crew was starting up. And I, I recall, like, some of those guys from Chicago came up to Milwaukee to, like, visit us and at first we're like cool you know it'll be cool to connect with these guys and then they all come in our house and they were very much like okay we're in charge now you guys are gonna knuckle under to us we're in command we're the ogs and we're like <laughs> no you're not motherfucker like we, we ended up chasing them out of our house and and we were that's all kind of how we rolled we were like no one's telling us what to do like we're we're in command now don't come thinking you're in command and, and there's a lot of uh when when the whole white power skinhead thing came about in the late 80s, a lot of these like old school neo-Nazis and Klansmen who had kind of been stagnant for a while started crawling up from under their rocks. And some of them made the mistake of trying to come to us like they would even call themselves commander and shit like that. And those guys got the shit kicked out of them. Like it, anybody who told us that we weren't in charge was going to get the shit kicked out of them, whether they claimed to be white power or not. So in a way, there there was kind of like initiation thing, but we were the ones like we're we're running this, like we're yeah. not here to to join anything. We're here to we're starting our own shit. You can join us if you want to, or you can get rolled over. At what point did it become violent against other groups? Was it a weekly thing? Was it you know planned? When did it turn violent? I I was I mean I've been I was violent my whole life and I I was pr very violent as a punk rocker we made uh, sport out of like brawling all the frat boys in, at UW Madison and I got my ass whooped by a gigantic guy who played center for the, <laughs> for the Wisconsin Badgers one night so I, and, like the violence was nothing new to me it was just like when, now we're all skinheads and we're we're gonna take it up a notch and uh, initially the violence was directed against non-racist skinheads, which is important to understand that the whole skinhead counterculture began in like the late 60s, early 70s in Britain. And originally it was not racist by any stretch. 
They listened to reggae. They, they included immigrants from the West Indies and from Pakistan and Asia, like amongst them in their skinhead crews. It wasn't until the late 70s that the National Front, which was an outright British fascist political party, saw the opportunity to kind of convert the white skinheads into like a kind of a brown shirt. And that, that's where the, the skin, racist skinhead offshoot came from. Now, White nationalism, like any other violent extremist group, requires a lot of mental gymnastics to make all the bullshit make sense. And part of our early mental gymnastics was, well, real skinheads are white power. If you're not racist, you're a baldy. And, and actually, the opposite was much more historically accurate. But we called any skinheads who weren't uh, overtly racist and part of our crew, we called them baldies. And we would spend our, our evenings trying to find where they live in the, in the city or go into places where they hung out. And if we found them, we'd beat the shit out of them. That was the, the majority of the early violence that happened. After a while, the anti-racist, anti-fascist presence in Milwaukee had been beat down so much that like there wasn't... They weren't. They didn't give us a, a decent fight, so we would like actually pack into vans and drive six hours to Minneapolis, where there was a ton of baldies and they were pretty tough. Or we'd drive down to Chicago, where there was also a ton of baldies there, and we we like needed that violent pushback to to keep us like galvanized and and dialed in the the hate that we were practicing. What was it about the Chicago Milwaukee? area that made it such a hot spot in the 80s for both the skinhead and the racist skinhead movement. Right. Well, I, I, as anybody who's been to both these cities knows, like Milwaukee is just a scale model of Chicago. <laughs> it's like the, pretty much the exact same city, just a third the size. I think it's the segregation in both cities, of, of which both cities are legendary for. Milwaukee has the humiliating dishonor of being the most segregated city in the United States for many years running. And um, it's it's only slightly behind, uh, or excuse me, Chicago's only slightly behind Milwaukee as far as like the level of uh, segregation goes. And that segregation causes horrific implications in the inner cities of Milwaukee and Chicago. Recently, in, in, in recent years, speaking of humiliating dishonors, Milwaukee has been named the worst place in the United States to be a black person. Hmm. What is that based on? Is that based on deaths of, of, or just crime against black people? It's based on like all sorts of standard of living metrics. So teen pregnancy is worse in Milwaukee for black people than it is anywhere else in the United States. Failure to graduate high school, failure to go to college, economic mobility, incarceration, homicide, like all of these metrics all fall into place. And, and of course, they're all interdependent and they drive each other. If people aren't graduating high school, they're going to be more likely to be out in the streets, getting in trouble, so going to prison, getting killed. Like all these things are linked together. And I know that was a huge factor in our white nationalist ideology because if you can't point at a, a ghetto and say, look, that's who our enemy is. That's what the threat is. And, and and very regularly when I was recruiting Joe Pissed Off White Kid, I'd be like, you ever been down to 27th and North Avenue? Like I, I'd name an intersection in the middle of the hood. And uh, first of all, white people in Milwaukee are still terrified to go to those neighborhoods. But uh, either way, I'm like, you ever been down there? No, no, I, I don't go down there. Well, you're wise to, but you know what? If we don't band together and fight for our race, the whole world's going to look like that. Your, your nice white neighborhood is going to look like that. And, and again, the violent extremist ideologies always have the little shreds of truth that they're based on. And the shred of truth we leaned on heavily was the north side of Milwaukee used to be not just a nice neighborhood, but like a very wealthy one. Um, Sherman Boulevard, which is like the, the biggest uh, strip through the north side of Milwaukee, is lined with all these beautiful mansions from like the heyday of beer brewing and things like that. And we would say, well, it used to be a white neighborhood. Now look at it. And that's what's going to happen to your neighborhood if you don't do something about it. If, if we wouldn't have had the north side of Milwaukee to point at and, and make those accusations, which, which are all like historically ridiculous, uh, you have to have a very like willful historical myopia 
to blame the conditions of the inner city on the people who live there when actually they were created by government policies of redlining saying black people can't live in the suburbs. Right. No one's going to borrow you money for a house. And, and, and it got to a point where like white people were like, we're not living in the city and they all moved out. So these conditions were caused by willful government systemic racism that's the fact. But of course, as skinheads, right? No, it, it was caused by the people who lived there. Do you think religion plays a role in any of this? And so I know at least with some of the suburbs, it's religion, just, just to give historical context, it creates like your tribe, right? It's like, you know each other because everybody sees each other at Sunday service. And then as religion has indoctrinated us to, to desire, let's say that tribalism or just tribalism in general, right. but as it sort of fades away, um, but sort of hangs on in the Midwest still, do you think is there interlinking between some of what you've been subjected to and religion during this time? Or is it like, are they intertwined in the Midwest? I, I think they are to a degree. And even going back to like Jim Crow and uh, reconstruction, there's that old saying like the, you want to see segregation, go to church on Sunday. Like that, that's what everybody goes to their churches. There's the black church, there's the white church. And, and up until fairly recently there, there was just not, uh, mixing between them. I, I think that certainly came into play in the Midwest and in the North. I, I don't know that it had as much of a role as it did down South, like in the Bible Belt proper. And in my case, both of my parents are, would describe themselves as spiritual, not re, not religious. So I, I did not go to church growing up. In fact, I, I despised Christianity growing up. Um, and I, I did, honestly, up until... Oh, 2009 or so when I became a Buddhist and found that like the teachings of Jesus Christ are actually pretty awesome. But as far as uh, my involvement in white nationalism went, religion wasn't much of a factor other than my disdain for, for Christianity. Socially, I, I think it, it definitely does help to create that kind of tribal feeling. And uh, I know in Mequon, there's some like very, very ritzy Catholic churches where uh, all the rich white people go, and uh, I haven't been in them in years, but I, I remember as a kid when I made the mistake, which I never made again, of sleeping over at my Catholic friend's house on Saturday night, and they would drag me to church on Sunday, and you go through this aerobics thing of stand, sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel, eat the Jesus crackers. Like I, even back then, though, I, I recall pretty clearly like those those church services were were entirely white. I remember one part of your book where you talk about going home, you're having family dinner, and it's the time that your mother says to you, you're, you're like a 16th Native American or Indian. And this mm. is, uh, at this time, it's like you had found your identity, right? And yeah. it was just crushed in that moment. Can you just give us a sense of what that was like? And yeah, just walk us through that. I mean, super, super pivotal part of the book. It was. That, that was suicide attempt number one during my, my seven year involvement in white nationalism. And what happened was, was it was Thanksgiving, which like many alcoholics, I come from two long lines of alcoholism. And at our Thanksgiving dinners, uh, you, the, the sober people were vastly outnumbered by the drunk people. And uh, so they were always kind of dysfunctional, but that, that this particular one, I'm there, I was 18. I'm there with my skinhead girl girlfriend, she's drunk. And I'm drunk out of my gourd and I'm going on about white nationalism and how we're under threat and we're superior and blah, 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 blah. And my dad is kind of like, oh, bullshit. And he's, he's pushing back, but he's drunk too. And I'm going on and on. And my mom kind of puts the brakes on all of this. And she goes, well, Mr. Nazi, do you know that your great grandpa Bordeaux was French Arcadian and that he was uh, Native American? which means you're one sixteenth Indian. You're not white. And I went ballistic. I was like, don't you ever say that to me again. And I'm cussing her out. And I'm, I'm just like, if the, the table wasn't this massive, like artifact heirloom, I, I probably would have tipped the table over. And I, I grabbed my girlfriend and we fled Thanksgiving dinner because I was so upset and we went back to this uh, shithole house we shared with a bunch of other skinheads. And we used to drink beer in returnable bottles. And I locked myself in the bedroom my girlfriend and I shared. 
And I started working through a case of these returnable bottles. And at some point it, it dawned on me, I should break one and carve my wrist up with it, which I did. And, um, later on, my girlfriend kicked the door down and came in there to find me lying on the ground. Uh, fortunately for me, I, I didn't know the trick that you're supposed to go, you know, parallel to your wrist rather than perpendicular. And, uh, well, I cut myself up pretty bad. It wasn't fatal. And my girlfriend, um, being a, a proper skinhead girl was not squeamish at the sight of blood, and she knew basic first aid, and she uh, put pressure on and bandaged me up and stopped it from bleeding. And the next day, I wrote a letter to Tom Metzger, who was uh, kind of like this elder statesman of white nationalism. He was a big deal back then. That he was kind of like the number one like David Duke level guy in the country. And I wrote him a letter saying, uh, my mom... My race trader mother told me that I'm 116th Indian and like my race is all I have and I'm, I'm humiliated and I don't know what to do. And I, I tried to kill myself and it didn't work, but I just want to kill myself again. And he wrote me right back saying, you know, you're a good Aryan white man. And if you got a nosebleed, you'd lose your Indian blood. And, you know, you need to get back on it and quit feeling sorry for yourself. And like a real kind of rah-rah pep talk. And uh, tragically, I don't have that letter anymore, but I did keep it around for like probably the rest of my neo-Nazi career as kind of like my pass. Like if, if that got out to anybody else in, the, in my group or in the movement, I'd be like, look, I got a letter from Tom Metzger that says I'm a good Aryan white man. And uh, that that helped me just like go, OK, great. You know, I'm just going to forget about this and uh, go full speed ahead. That is Fucking crazy. That was, <laughs> yeah, dude. That, that was one yeah. of the moments when I was reading your book that I thought, okay, this was one of those pivotal moments that everything was shaken up. Right. And instead of turning the lens back on yourself and, and, and looking hard at your belief system, you doubled down and, mm. and sought out validation from, from this other white nationalist instead of just questioning or or even allowing your belief system to be questioned and there mm -hmm. were a couple other moments in the book where that happened but this was the one to me where it was like okay well maybe maybe this one moment and then like right back into it and and so like what i and i know we'll get there eventually when when you did start to, to come around but what did you expect to happen from that letter because clearly you wrote to him for a reason and you wanted that validation but was his response kind of what you were looking for? The response is exactly what I was looking for. And and I, Tom Metzger, even at that point, was a, a master at manipulating people. And and I had, I kind of had that same gift it, it, where I, when I would recruit Joe pissed off white kid into the group, I, I wanted to find out everything wrong in his life and then blame it on Jews, blame it on blacks, blame it on gay people, blame it on everyone but him which has a, a, a dual purpose. The first purpose is it's just, it's way easier to blame all your bullshit on everybody else, but you, than it is to look inward. Like you said, and be like, Hey, what do I got to do to fix this? So it's an easy way out. And the second purpose, which is far more insidious is that when you blame everything wrong in your life on other people, you're literally just casting away your ability to fix it. And so your life continues to spiral downwards, which means you're going to just go deeper and deeper in uh, white nationalism, as I did. And, and I don't doubt that that was Metzger's intention when, when he wrote me back. It's a great, it's a great response. I mean, you, that's a nosebleed amount of blood. Like, that's a, that's a crazy, right? that's like brilliant, right? It's like, how persuasive does it get? It's insane. So one of the things that, so new territory today, we have 23 in me and all these DNA tests. And so my wife thought she was Italian. She takes the thing, turns out she's like 60% Ireland or Irish. And obviously we can trace like the migration, you know, and so the, yeah, it's a melting pot. So how is this viewed, right? So if you took one of those tests, it, we'd probably find out you're a whole bunch of stuff. Um, <laughs> like, like, and, like all of us, right? And so how does that play into the white supremacist mindset? And does it just take a good salesperson to rewire and be like, oh, that's a, that's a, no, that's a nosebleed amount, right? How do you view well, any of that? Interestingly, I, I did 23andMe last year. Uh, they had some sale and I got one and my daughter and I both did it. 
And uh, one of the first things I thought when I got the results was like, well, I could have really used this back in the day because I, I was actually about as pure-blooded Aryan of a white man that you could possibly imagine. It was like just way skewed to Northern European and a little bit, I think I had like 0.02% Somali. And that was like, other than that, it was like as, as Aryan white man as you could get. No Native American. At wow. all. Interesting. And I, I brought it up to my mom, and she's like, no, I, I don't think that's right. And I'm like, well, that's, that's what the DNA says. And it was interesting. I, I, I've i seen uh, some media pieces where some, like, avowed white supremacists were confronted with their DNA results, showing that they weren't pre-blooded Aryan white people after all. And th- there's two predominant responses for that. Um, the, the really, really easy, lazy one is to say that the whole thing is Jewish propaganda mm. to corrupt the minds of white men. I mean, that's the boilerplate response to whenever the truth gets inconvenient. Oh, it's Jewish propaganda. It's, it's fake news. Um, it's the exact same mental process that people on both sides of the political aisle go through when they just go, oh, that's fake news. That's one of the responses you get. The other response that you get from like the the pseudo intellectual types of which there's like there's always been kind of a faction of pseudo intellectualism within these racist movements. And nowadays they're really like dialed in on IQ and uh, they you know show a thing like this. These are the most diverse countries on Earth. And like this is all the most fucked up countries on Earth. And go figure the diverse ones are the most fucked up ones. Mm. And I'm like okay, then why does half the United States GDP come from New York and California? <laughs> and then they're like, well, and, and so now they, they go back to their pseudoscience. And what the pseudo t- pseudoscientists would say about DNA is they just say, well, yeah, but then, then we evolved. Right. Like white people went to, you know, came about in Europe in a very harsh environment. Where there, you know, you you weren't just like lazing about in the jungle picking fruits and feeding yourself without lifting a finger, which isn't true whatsoever. But they they made they they cast it like that, that like people of color stayed in the, in this easy environment, whereas white people migrated to a very harsh environment where you had to be a lot smarter to survive. And you had to be more dedicated and more conquering and stronger. And, and they would actually kind of spin it around as to as justification for their beliefs rather than like a legitimate challenge to them. That's crazy. And I guess since we're talking a little bit about the future as it relates to 23andMe and these new companies, is is white supremacy bigger now? Is it a greater threat than it used to be? Are people leaning into it more? How do you view it now? I... Uh, I'm very much an optimist. I, I believe that human society has been steadily progressing for 200,000 years and that progress has always been kind of a two-step forward, one-step back process. And I think we're definitely in a step back right now, but we, we're progressing nonetheless. And I think one of the best pieces of evidence for this is that diversity is so inevitable that even groups who organize around the idea of diversity being bad and toxic and unhealthy are becoming more diverse, whether they like it or not. Right. And one of the, the, an example of this is, is that I saw this data like four or five years ago. I'm not sure what the latest update is, but I have plenty of anecdotal evidence as well. But the, for a time, the fastest growing demographic of the alt-right was Latino men. Huh. who were U.S. citizens who were just like buying all this xenophobic uh, anti-immigrant sentiment hook, line, and sinker and, and just putting everything behind it. I've, I've heard Latino men say things like, I'm glad we were colonized by Spain. You know, like we were sacrificing each other and the king stabbing himself in the nuts to see what, you know, where to plant the, plant the crops. Like we, Spain did us a favor. And, and it's, it's, to me, it's very much like Stockholm Syndrome but uh, mm. that mindset is not uncommon. To that point, then, would I think people might be wrong to assume that it's in it's in places people can easily point to, right? Where it's like people will say, "Oh, that's a, that's in the South," or "Oh, it's in the Midwest." But, but right. what you're saying, maybe not. Maybe it can be in every everywhere that situation might exist, um, where you can point to a group and say, "Look, see, 
that could be anywhere in the United States, right? You'd say it's probably a myth, right? To, to assume it, it, it just exists in the South, let's say. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think it's, it, you know, at the same time, though, I, I think there are, we're all a, mi- a mixture of nature and nurture. And th- there's certainly environmental factors that have a lot to do with uh, the story you choose to believe. If you live in a diverse place, like New York City or, or Los Angeles, and I understand both New York and Los Angeles have their pockets of, you know, this is where the rich people live, this is where the poor people live, there's a lot of racial issues with the rich and poor, things like that. But if you live in a diverse area where diversity is the norm, you're going to be less likely to be afraid of it than someone who lives out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere, has never seen a Muslim person, never met a person of color. Uh, it's just, we're, it, it's a normal thing for human beings to fear what they don't understand. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, yes and no. Uh, you know, it can happen anywhere, but I think it is more likely to happen where people are physically uh, isolated from diversity. Do you think having Donald Trump as president is galvanizing for the movement, like a lot of people assume? I, I absolutely think it is. I, in my day, in the late 80s and early 90s, it would have been absolutely unthinkable to imagine the president of the United States saying that our country is being infested by people who are crossing our borders illegally and, and liking them to vermin. Hmm. That, that, was the, that was how we talk. And, and we, back in the late 80s, early 90s, like, Pat Buchanan was about the farthest right that you got. And, and we didn't, well, he would get kind of xenophobic, but he was just kind of a minor player. He wasn't, right. you know, he's, he was a pundit, he's a poor politician, whatever. He, he didn't have that much influence. Like your run of the mill GOP in the late 80s, early 90s were very much more, you know, George Bush, Repu- you know, Reagan kind of thing, where you could certainly argue there was some racist uh, undertones to their beliefs. And their policies and their actions, there is nothing like overtly racist about it. And uh, that pissed us off. We were like, you know, fuck them. They're as bad as the liberals. They, they don't care about the white race. Nowadays, every single person that I've helped to leave hate groups in the past 10 years from 2016 on was like before they left, they were huge cheer- cheerleaders of Donald Trump. And there, there were uh, Klan groups who put up like robocall campaigns for him. So, you know, I, wow. it doesn't matter that his son-in-law is Jewish. It doesn't matter how many black church leaders he gathers in the Oval Office from time to time. I don't honestly think that personally Donald Trump is like an avowed. I, I think he's he'll just say whatever gets him phrased. I think that's what motivates him. I don't think race motivates him. But at the same time, what he says to get praise really resounds with racists. I read a, I recently read a book about Facebook and um, went pretty deep into the election. And basically what it was showing was he was just testing different phrases, different, different sayings in all these different groups. And so whether you were white of this income in different, different target demographics and what he mm. was realizing, he could literally like pick posts by cities and see which ones are being reshared a lot and on facebook you, that's that's what you want the more it gets shared the more likes the more it propagates the bigger circle seeing it and the strategy meetings he would have were not around okay you know mr trump what are your policies it was like what is what is working and then he would just lean, right. lean into that yep and which good and bad right good if if you want to win bad if you're propagating a message that doesn't necessarily inspire or lead or, or move the country or civilization into yeah it just gets you elected but it doesn't mean you're doing good by anybody no exactly i, I think it's certainly a win at all costs approach yeah and um i i think a big factor of that is his advisor stephen miller who, who is right. like an outright white nationalist. And the right. first thing anybody on the right's going to say, Tucker Carlson would be like, he's Jewish. <laughs> How can a Jew be a white nationalist? Uh, very easily. But back in my day, there, there were a, a number of guys who like, after the fact, we find out they're Jewish after they had joined our group and been in it for months. And they, they got the, they were violently expelled, but it, it was, it was not uncommon for Jews, for people of color. I even had in the early days, like before I went like full blown white power, there was a black skinhead who hung out with us and he would, he had a collection of black people jokes. 
he would like rip on black women. I, I, he, he was like very much like wow. self-loathing black person. So they, they, this, this idea of like, well, he's Jewish. How can he be a white nationalist? No, there's, that doesn't stop you whatsoever. It doesn't right. mean that you can't be that when your policies are, are outright white nationalism. Arno, you, you talked about the strategies that you employed in getting other people out of the white power movement. But I want to touch upon, like in your book, you said like the big catalyst for you shifting gears and doing a 180 degree turn was the birth of your daughter. Mm. And, but even then, it, it struck me the honesty that it wasn't a here one day gone the next moment. It took years for you to right. to leave the or maybe not years for you to leave the, the movement entirely, but for you to become a better father too. I think you said eleven. She was eleven years old when you finally mm. got sober. Right. And so it's it's that's one of the things that strikes me about getting people to kind of see the light of day and come out of these darker movements is that it's not a an easy or quick process. Can right. you talk about your journey over those those years and and just how in the book you mentioned that the kindness shown to you from minorities, people of color was really like another part of like the the persistent kind of re-educating that it required to get yeah, you, you to flip the switch. You mentioned the black lady at breakfast, right? And that was such a such a powerful, can you, maybe we'll start on that. Yeah. So at McDonald's? Yes. Yeah. It's a great story and it, it definitely, uh, to me, it's an example of the power of kindness. So early on in my white power days, because I'm a gifted genius, I thought it'd be clever to get a swastika tattooed on the middle finger of my right hand, which has since been covered up. Uh, by the way, Nick, do you know who love. covered that up? Was it Chris? Chris Buckley. Oh, gotta love it. God, what a, what, I, I, want, I do want to touch on him eventually. We but, will yeah. for sure. We yeah. will for sure. Um, so I had this swastika on my middle finger. And just to paint the picture, like I am this like stinking drunk, lanky, tattooed and scarred, shaved head, neo-Nazi skinhead. I got swastikas tattooed on me. I typically had scars everywhere, stitches in my head, like big swastikas on my jacket. There was no, no one would have been like, oh, maybe he's a racist. Like I'm clearly a racist. It was very, very plain. And there was a McDonald's I went into. And I, at this point I, I was, uh, I existed on ramen noodles and not like good, you know, artesian ramen, like they got at Silver Lake ramen. It, it, these are like the bricks, the 10 for a dollar ramen. And uh, it was just something that filled my stomach. And that's what I ate all week long to, so I'd have more drinking money. But one day a week on payday, I would go to McDonald's and I'd get a Big Mac. And that was like the only thing I ate all week that wasn't ramen noodles. And it was, I all week long, I'm looking forward to that Big Mac. And I, it never occurred to my gifted genius self that maybe if I didn't drink so much, I could have ate Big Macs more often. I don't know which would have been worse for me. But in any case, I go into this McDonald's to get my Big Mac. And behind the counter is this elderly black woman working there, taking orders. And I froze in the doorway because she had this beautiful smile on her face that was so genuine and so like unconditional for everybody. I, I liken it to the sun in the sense that the sun shines on everyone. Doesn't care what color your skin is, how much money you got, don't got, who you love, who you don't love, who you vote for, like the sun just shines. And that's how her smile was. And it made me really, really uncomfortable because I'm trying to hate black people. And here's this sweet, genuine old lady, like making that seem as stupid as it is. So I go get my food, I scurry out of there. Next week, payday, I come back to the same McDonald's. It was right next to the place where I cashed my check. And she's there again. And this time she recognizes me. And she remembered what I ordered. She's asking me about my day. And I'm all the more uncomfortable now. This is like fucking with my whole program. So again, I get my food and I scurry out of there. The next week goes by. And in, in between these visits is when I got the swastika tattoo. So the third time I go back to this McDonald's, the third payday, now I have the swastika tattoo and I specifically got it to enrage people. Like I wanted to hurt people at the sight of it. And then if they wanted to do something about it, I'd close my fist and I'd physically hurt them. Like that was why I got that tattoo. 
And I certainly was not thinking of the sweet, gentle old black lady who worked at McDonald's when I got the tattoo. But when I walked, tried to walk into that door, I literally froze in the doorway again. And I just had this almost like instinctive thought. I'm just like, I don't want her to see this. And I, I put my hand in my back pocket and I'm just like, what, does not anybody else work here? <laughs> like I'm waiting for seeing somebody else comes up there. Nobody does. I'm thinking like, where's the next closest McDonald's? It's December, it's freezing, and I'm hungry, and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to keep my hand in my pocket, and she won't see it. So I go up there, and it didn't occur to me that it's pretty difficult to reach in your pocket to get a, a bill with, without showing the back of your hand. And despite my best efforts, she sees the tattoo, and she just says, like my grandma used to say to me when I, she'd catch me beating on my little brother. She was just kind of like, what is that on your finger? And I couldn't look her in the eye. I just like looked down at my steel-toed skinhead boots and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, it's nothing. And she waited until I looked up again. And when I did look up, our eyes met and she just said, I know that's not who you are. You're a better person than that. And I was just like, can I have my big bag, please? And I got my food and I scurried out of there. And I, I would love to say that I went skipping out of McDonald's going, racism, stupid. She's so nice. Like, glad that's done. But I actually, I went home. I got as drunk as I could, as fast as I could. I went out in the streets and I attacked the first person I could find because I wanted to put as much space between me and this like singularity of humanity that I experienced as I possibly could. But the, the thing about human experiences, and this is why people like my friend Party can make a living in mental health, is that we can't subtract things from our experience. Once something happens to us, it's there. And we can't just remove it. We can't pretend it never happened. All we can do is process it and deal with it. And I, it was all I could do to not process that act of kindness, to not deal with it. And for seven years, this happened like within my first couple months of being a skinhead, for seven years, that experience was part of me. And I, despite my best efforts to rip out that seed that she had planted, it took root and it grew alongside other seeds of kindness that I was so fortunate to experience. And it left less and less room in my heart for the kind of hate that it takes to hate people. And so it took seven years to get to the point where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I got to change. And that woman's kindness was an integral part of the exhaustion that led me to that point. That's crazy. And such a good story. I mean, just, just the, the small acts of kindness that goes such a long way in perpetuity. I mean, I really forgotten today when I've had a lot of friends that have gone through the AA program and it's changed their li their lives in way more ways than just, you know, quitting, right. It's changed their lives professionally. It's changed the way they look at their time with their, their family. In some cases they've transcended to become a different human for others. It's just a way of coping on the daily basis for you. Has, what did it do for you? Well, I, it's it, this. This will require a disclaimer first uh, ahead of time, saying I, I know I can't even count how many people I know whose lives were saved by Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, some other kind of twelve-step program. More power to them. More power to and, and honestly, I I have like the utmost respect for anybody who says who reaches a point in their life and they're like, hey, I'm fucking up. I need help. I'm gonna go get that help. Like that is one of the bravest, most difficult things a human being can do. 100%. In, in my case, though, I drank profusely for 20 years from the time I was 14 until I was 34. And the impetus for me stopping drinking was I started having these pains in, like by my kidney where after a night of drinking, I would wake up like writhing in pain, biting on a belt to keep from screaming and it, I didn't have health insurance, so I thought I went to the emergency room. And it just like every time I drank, it happened like clockwork. And I'm like, okay, I got to quit drinking. And I didn't know anything about AA other than that's where you went to quit drinking and that you had a sponsor. Other than that, I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know anything about it. I had a guy I worked with who was in AA and I knew about it because he told me about it every day, but he didn't say like the, the nuts and bolts of it. He just talked about like, oh, I'm a drunk and I need help quit drinking. I have a sponsor, yada, yada, yada. So I make a plan. I'm going to quit New Year's Eve of uh, going from 2003 to 2004. 
And that night I sat home and I drank a case of beer by myself. And I remember being toward the end of the case and not even wanting those last beers. But I'm like, drink up, motherfuckers. The last beer you're ever going to drink. Like, finish the case. And I'm like, all right. So I finished the case. And then I sit down on my computer. My guy's, my buddy's name's Dave. I send him this drunken, super dramatic email. Dave, I'm going to quit drinking. I need help. I'm going to go to AA. You're going to be my sponsor. And he emails me back right away. And I'm kind of like, I'm like, if you don't drink, what are you doing up at 3 a.m. on Dude's <laughs> Eve? But anyway, he emails me back and he's just as melodramatic and he's like first of all you gotta check yourself in a hospital You're, you could die of dts and i'm like yeah whatever i'll be all right and then he goes uh second of all i can't be your sponsor i'm not ready to be a sponsor yet but i'll introduce you to my sponsor and i'm like okay cool that works and then he goes um and third of all you gotta go to a meeting tonight and then you go to a meeting every night for 90 days and i'm like what <laughs> wait what and he's like yeah that's how it works and i'm like Really? And he's like, yeah, that's what, that's how people like can leave that they need that support to stop drinking. And I'm like, huh? Okay. Uh, and I'm like, I'll, I'll get back to you, dude. And I, I send the email back and then I pass out and I woke up the next day with this ripping hangover. I was probably still drunk. And I remember the hangover lasted a couple days. And during the, these couple days of miserable hangover, I'm thinking to myself, like, all right, dude, how serious are you about quitting drinking? Like, are you really going to do it or are you not? And I'm, I'm really serious. I'm having this inner conversation. I'm serious. And then I said, all right, dude, well, here's the deal. You quit drinking on your own or you're going to be sitting in some church basement full of black coffee, swilling, chain smoking, dry drunks every night for, th for three months. Mm. That's the deal. And the idea of doing that was so distasteful to me. I have not had a drop of alcohol since. Wow. So I, I've never been to AA proper. I've never been to an AA meeting. The fear of AA got you out. <laughs> right. The, 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 just the idea of going was enough to like, and, and by my means of quitting drinking was very unconventional. I, I, I had like a physical like thirst for beer. So I weaned myself off by drinking NA beer. Hmm. And smoking a shit ton of pot for like six months. And then I got to the point where I'm like, oh, I quit smoking cigarettes. I quit smoking pot. I, I successfully did not have a drop of beer or any other alcohol. Um, a big factor in that was after I made this deal with myself about how it was going to go, then I was like, okay, now we're going to bring it home by telling mom and telling your daughter. And so I told my mom first, I'm like, hey, mom, I'm quitting drinking. And my mom, who has dealt with, me and my father, Arno the third and my grandpa, Arno the second and all kinds of drunks in her family. My mom's like, sure, <laughs> sure. You're quitting drinking. <laughs> sure you are. Yeah. Good luck with that. And she just kind of blew me off. And then my daughter though, who was 11 years old at the time, I told her I was quitting drinking. And the whole time I drank, she never said anything to me about it. And, and like, I spent a lot of time with my daughter throughout her whole childhood, but I was drunk for most of it. Mm. I, I was either drunk or hung over. And, and I, to, I mean, to my grave, that will be one of many things that haunt me is that my, ch my daughter's childhood was soiled by my drinking and there's nothing I can do about that. But she never said anything about it. And when I told her I was quitting, she said, I'm really glad to hear that dad. Cause I always hated it when you were drunk. Oh, wow. And the few times where I was tempted, and, and honestly, I wasn't tempted many times. I I, I started to like, I, I enjoyed sobriety. I, I really enjoyed not having hangovers. But the few times that I have been tempted, I just remember my daughter saying that, and that was all I needed to be like, okay, yeah, I'm not having any. And I haven't had any for, uh, I don't know, since 2004. So it was it was 16 years this year. I make a point of not saying that I'm clean and sober because I'm not. I, I do use cannabis pretty regularly. I also use it very moderately. Um, I, I don't wake and bake. I don't uh, drive on it. I don't – and I honestly, I don't like getting, like, super stoned. I just, like, yeah. taking a wee puff at night. And um, my body's, like, destroyed from all the stupid shit I ever did. I have arthritis in all my joints. I have post concussion syndrome. Uh, I have insomnia. So, like – there, there's a real medical case for marijuana for me and, and I can use it responsibly. So I do. 
but I don't don't drink because I can't drink responsibly, and I'm I'm delighted about it every single day. You know, you mentioned in the book, and this is one of the quotes that stuck with me the most, is that your dad cried twice in his life, once mm. when your dog died, and then the other time was when he told you how proud he is of the work that you're doing now. And yeah. and in the book that you, you mentioned, your mom was always quick to see the good in you, but your dad mm. was more the disciplinarian type. And I'm wondering, how long did it take your dad to forgive you for for mm. for your past transgressions I, I again i'm i'm so lucky in, in like a billion different ways but one of the the things i'm most lucky about is that i do have such an amazing family and again enjoying irony <laughs> like my my pain point as a kid was my father's drinking it, it put a ton of pressure on my mom. She was like sometimes working two jobs to pay the bills. Her relationship with him sucked. They fought constantly. But it was also my parents' love for me, my mom and my dad, throughout the time that I had become this person that they just were disgusted by. But they, they were like, we're not going to give up on you. We love you. We want you back. We're always here to help you. And my dad even... At one point, uh, even my mom got divorced when they were eight, when I was 18. And it really wasn't until they got divorced that I was able to kind of like connect with either of them. But once they did, like I started to get like a little closer to my mom and I, I got a lot closer to my dad. And, and especially in the sense that I'd go out drinking with him, um, then we'd sit around drinking. And at one point, it, you know, some late drunken night, my dad's just like, you know, I'm so goddamn proud of you, Arnie. I'm very proud of you. And I'm just like, I'm like in the depths of my skinhead shit now. And I knew he hated that. I knew he didn't like, he wasn't proud of that. So I asked him, I'm like, oh, yeah. I thought you hated the, you know, white supremacy and white power dad. How are you proud of me? Cause that's all I'm doing now. And he's just like, I'm just proud that you're my son and that you are the, the human being that you are and you're making mistakes now, but you're going to grow out of them and you're going to learn from them and, and you're going to do great things someday. <laughs> you know, just, and, and again, this is like Arno 4 and Arno 3, stinking drunk uh, midnight kind of conversation, but I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. And he meant that. And, and I think uh, yeah. um, that that time where he, he was brought to tears by the work I'm doing now, like that was him saying like, hey, I was right. I, I was right not to give up on this kid. Let's talk about your exit plan. So how did you get out? What's that process like? One of my other huge chunks of luck was that about a year and a half after I left the movement, the only friend I had was a kid who had like kind of just dipped his toes in the movement for maybe six months. And then he's like, fuck this. I'm done with this. It, it was funny. I interviewed him uh, for writing my first book. And I needed a lot of like corroboration because I was always so drunk back then. I interviewed about 10 people who had been in and out with me. And I asked him like why he got out. And he's like, dude, it's really difficult to get laid being a neo-Nazi. <laughs> you don't go like walking up to a bunch of hot girls and be like, yeah, so uh, uh, that's the white race. <laughs> you know, like, he's, he's like, I, I, I wanted to get laid again. Like he, he was a big ladies man. And he's like, I, it just wasn't happening in the movement. There is a sausage party. There's no <laughs> girls. And, and for good reason. And I'm like, okay, yeah, well, that makes sense. But he was my only friend and he was a raver. Like every Saturday night, he's going to a rave party on the south side of Chicago or up in the sticks in Wisconsin in a cornfield somewhere. And I would hang out with him during the week. And we'd sit around the house drinking. And he'd like kind of – I love the Beastie Boys before I got in the movement. And when I got out, like, I'll never forget one day, me and him were like just stoned out of our mind, laying on the floor of his bedroom listening to Check Your Head by the Beastie Boys. And I'm just like <gasps> – if this is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> this is there's a bunch of Jews playing black people music, and it's the best thing ever. And and it was really like hanging out with him that kind of like reconnected me to the beauty of humanity and culture and not being afraid of these things. And the the kind of the the final step of it was 
he was telling me about these rave parties and I was like terrified to go because I'm like, I'm not going to the South side of Chicago. You're insane. You're out of your mind. And I'm, I don't want to dance. Like, I don't know how to dance. I just, I dance with people's heads. That's only kind of dance that I know how to do. How am I supposed to know how to dance? And he's like, dude, you just go and you just start moving. Like the, the, the bass is so loud. You got no choice. All right. <laughs> and I'm just, it took him a while to get me to the point where I was like, one Saturday, finally, I didn't want to sit by myself Saturday night. I'm like, all right, dude, where's the party? And he's like, well, there's one on the south side of Chicago. You want to drive down there? I'm like, let's go. And that was my first rave party I went to. And and I literally, it was such the polar opposite of everything that I had been. It was, rave has a, a, a mantra of peace, love, unity, and respect. And it's something that like the OG ravers kind of laugh at tongue in cheek nowadays, but it really was about that. It was like, I go to this party at the South side of Chicago, it's 3000 people who are not only getting along and 3000 people of every possible ethnicity, sexual background, social economic background, nationality, it could not have been more hyper diverse. And these 3000 people are not only getting along, they're having the time of their lives. And they, there's like literally a palpable spiritual love for one another. And this feeling like you're just a cell in this big organism. And I did MDMA for the first time that night. I, that was a huge, I'm not gonna say it wasn't a factor. Um, MDMA or ecstasy or Molly as it's known now was developed as a psychotherapy drug for people to like kind of work past their bullshit. And it certainly worked me past my bullshit. And, and it, to the point where, you know, Saturday night I'm, I'm at these parties and I'm rocking out and I'm just, I'm, I don't give a fuck. I'm just dancing. Like there's nobody watching. There's no tomorrow. I'm, I'm like, look like I jumped in a pool with my clothes on. I'm covered in sweat and I don't give a shit. I'm having the best time ever. And then on Wednesday, like the drugs are long out of my system. But I'll be walking down the street on Wednesday afternoon and I'll see some dude on the sidewalk. And five years earlier, I would have just as soon jumped on this guy and, and beat the living fuck out of him for, for absolutely zero reason. And now I'd see him walking down the sidewalk and I'd be like, that guy's my brother. Mm. I, I hope he's having an awesome day. Like, I love him. I, I hope he's I hope everything works out for him. They're like genuinely feeling that way. That, that was what the, the rave scene taught me is that it's not only possible, but like healthy and, and very like healing to have that kind of love for other human beings. And the other thing it taught me was the, the power of forgiveness. There, there was uh, this whole like right four sleeve now where I have this kind of kanji guy used to be a big pile of skulls and swastikas and I had a bust of an SS soldier and it said white power. Like, again, no mistaking what this is about. I remember sitting at, on the floor of some filthy dilapidated warehouse at four in the morning on Sunday and this, some girl has my forearm in her lap and she's like kind of stroking the swastika tattoo and looking at me like, and she's like, what's that about? And I'm like, well, I, I used to be a Nazi skinhead. I feel really bad about it. And she's like, you're not anymore, are you? And I'm like, no. And she's like, okay. <laughs> like That's how everybody was back then. I had gay friends. I had black friends. I had gay black friends. Like in every single one of them, even though they knew who I used to be, were like, it don't matter who you used to be, dude. Like you're here with us now. Like rock out, have fun. Drink some water. You look like you need, you got to be hydrated. <laughs> like it was, it was just, they, they demonstrated for me how powerful forgiveness was, how powerful compassion was. And it, it really like kind of began the, the healing process that I'm still going through and I'll be going through the rest of my life. But if, if it wasn't for those, for that step and, and, and I'm still friends with a ton of people from those days nowadays. And when I see them, when I talk to them, I, I always let them know, I'm like, dude, you help me get from there to here. And, and I'll always be grateful for that. The thing that I mean, incredible, just just that the realization and then having an epiphany of sorts over time to get out hard enough hard enough to get there then to make the decision to completely lean in right to completely start a movement because at this point you have to you have to tell the world who you were it's not like right. you, you can just move to let's say massachusetts no one knew right. you before start new a lot of people i would imagine do that 
They just change, right. change their mindset. Let me go somewhere nobody knows me. Here you go, starting something, a brand new journey. People can now Google you. You're putting it out there. What on earth was that like? Well, that, that was an act of self-preservation as well. I was doing IT consulting from 2001 up until about 14 or 15. And I was uh, self-employed and I was, I was good at it. And I had a pretty decent client base and I was getting by. And at one point uh, I got a bunch of like stoner Linux guys with me and some very unwise partners. And we like incorporated into a company and we're going to do open source health software and I, I ran the joint to the ground. I'm <laughs> horrible, horrible with money and things like that. But I, I remember thinking back then, like, even then, like, dreaming of our IPO. I'm like, I'm going to start a nonprofit in the inner city that, like, helps businesses start. And then people whose businesses were helped start by it, like, reach back and help other people up. And I'm going to name it after my friend who was murdered. Like I, I, I always had that idea that I, I had to do something to atone for my past. I had to do something to repair the harm. Mm -hmm. I drove the company in the ground, so obviously my IPO thing didn't work out. But it was actually in 2006, I met this woman who I was like head over heels crazy about from the first second I seen her. We hung out platonically for like three, four months, got really close, and then we started getting naked, and I'm just insane about this woman and i'm sober this is like the first time i quit smoking pot at this point too i i was this is the first time i ever had a relationship being sober and i was just absolutely over the moon for her and she like didn't want to hear anything about my past anytime we come up she's like that's fucked up i don't want to know nothing about that and mm. she also was like in her early 30s she had a kid who i who i loved but she also had her biological clock ticking. She wanted to have more kids. She came from a background of, of poverty or, you know, really difficult childhood. And she worked as a hairstylist in a really bougie hair salon with cutting rich people's hair. And she was just in her head. She's like, I'm going to be rich someday. I'm going to, I'm going to drive a Range Rover and I'm going to have a McMansion to park it in. And I would tell her, I'd be like, well, I live with my mom and I'm six figures in debt. <laughs> She'd be like, yeah, I'm not happy about that. And, and ultimately she dumped me and I was just devastated. It, it just, uh, it was one of the most traumatic things I've ever been through, but what it was really about, like looking back on it, it wasn't about her. It was about my past and my past being unreconciled. And I, I remember after she dumped me, I, I was like in the suicidal depression for almost a full year. And it was so bad that I resented my daughter for being the reason I couldn't kill myself. Mm -hmm. if, if I didn't have a daughter at that point, I would have killed myself. Mm -hmm. Like, hands down. I had no doubt in my mind. But because of her, I couldn't. And I resented her for it. That's how miserable I was. And I remember having, again, these inner conversations. And what the main one was this. I would be like, where the fuck do you get off? thinking that you're going to go waltzing off into the sunset with a beautiful woman who loves you after all of the people that you hurt, after all of the harm that you've done. And I knew even then that there was probably people that I had destroyed physically that were still hurting from the, the beating I give them, and not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. I knew my parents were still hurting from what I did to them. I knew my daughter was hurting from what I did to her. And I, I just hated myself more than I ever hated anybody else, ever. And it was, it was my daughter who snapped me out of it. She was a 13, 14. She was having a hard time in school. She literally grabbed me by the collar, like, Dad, fucking snap out of it. Like, I need a dad. P.S. She was a bitch anyway. <laughs> like, I'm glad that she's out of your life because I didn't like her. And I was like, all right, maybe I do got to snap out of this. And that's when I started writing. So I started writing what would later become My Life After Hate. In 2009, I put the three words Life After Hate together. I registered the domain name. I got the idea to start an online magazine called Life After Hate, where it was not just former violent extremists, but also survivors of violent extremism talking about compassion and really just talking about their past with openness and honesty. And I was really starting to get my groove on about how healing that was to do it, how cathartic it was. 
And also I started uh, meditating in 2009 and that, that was a huge, huge step forward. Without my meditation practice, I would not have been able to take the next step. And essentially what my meditation practice, the first time I sat and learned how to meditate, I, I realized that if I can like deal with this intruding thought of a double cheeseburger with the works as I'm trying to focus on my breath, I can deal with this grudge I have against myself. Mm. Like it's all the same raw material. Now, granted, the, the grudge is a mountain of decades of suffering, but if I can move this thought, I can move that thought. And so the possibility of self-forgiveness came from my med meditation practice. And that's what kind of drove me to carry it forward and uh, brought me to where, I'm at to where I am today. You know, you mentioned earlier on in this, in this conversation that you can't erase the human experience. Like every, every little detail that happens to you, you carry that forward going through in your life. And I think that more than anything else perfectly describes how you approach connecting with people who are in hate groups and want out. And in fact, like I, I it's exactly the kind of work that I got to see you do firsthand uh, with Chris Buckley. And so um, for the listeners of the show, the reason I know Arno is because in 2016, I was an associate producer on a TV show that never aired, but it was focused on people who were in hate groups, whether it be the KKK, the neo-Nazis, the racist skinheads, and who either wanted out or their families wanted them out. And we would bring people like Arno in to connect with them and kind of bring them back into the light. And it was it was moments like, I'll never forget this. We were we were sitting down with, with you and, and Chris Buckley, who used to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And you had brought Chris to a Mexican restaurant. And you showed him the Latino family sitting across the restaurant from you guys and showing him how look at the love this father has for his son or his daughter. This is the exact same love that you show to your son and your daughter. And it's mm -hmm. moments like that that you were so consistent with that really struck me as, oh, this is, this is everything that Arno is about right now, is the, just the consistency of the message and never wavering from it. And it built up into this thing that Chris could not deny anymore. He could not deny mm -hmm. that all of his preconceived notions were false and and right. it was actually quite beautiful to see and and really i mean that's part of my human experience now i've i've carried that going forward and i want you to talk a little bit about what it was like going through the the moment when you first met chris to mm. to now where chris is is giving speeches and and talking to groups about his former life and how he repented and how he advocates and and wages peace as you like to put it Right, right. Chris is, I, again, of all these things I'm so lucky for, meeting Chris uh, is something I'm always grateful for. He's just an amazing human being. And uh, as you know, when when I met him, he was in a really rough place. And I know we all suspected on the production, but like on top of being a, an Imperial Nighthawk of the Ku Klux Klan, Chris was also a, a raging methamphetamine addict the entire time we were shooting. Mm -hmm made production challenging at times. Yeah. But when we sat down and talked with him, one of Chris's amazing talents, and, and he, this is one of the reasons why it's just a travesty that that show hasn't aired. And I'll, my dream is that it will be resurrected somehow, someday. But I, I have never seen anybody open up for a camera the way Chris Buckley does. The, the way he did then and the way he still does now. Things that, that most people are absolutely terrified of, Chris leans into and just goes, boom, here you go. Sometimes very often to a fault. But um, he he's such bravery to do that. And I talk about Chris all the time. I work with him all the time now. Both him and I are part of a group called Parents for Peace. People can find it at parentsforpeace.org with the number four. And just this past Monday, we did a online panel with the One World Foundation uh, club at Emmanuel College in Boston on the day when the Boston Marathon was supposed to happen. And One World was founded by Dave Fortier, and uh, who was a survivor of the, the attack in the Boston Marathon. And his daughter, Elizabeth, uh, organized One World uh, Emmanuel College. And so they had us on, along with our, our colleague, Mubin Sheikh, who's a former jihadi. We, we had Mubin talk to Chris also during the production, which you remember. And then our executive director, Miriam Nadri Churchill, who's an amazing woman, uh, mental health professional. 
And during that panel, Chris goes last, first of all. Like, he's the headliner. <laughs> like, movie, I, I went, and then Moomin went, and then Chris brought it home. And he brings it home because what he, his story is so powerful, and he's so fearless. And I remember just watching on the Zoom window, the way we're looking at now, seeing Chris fearlessly talk about how he was sexually assaulted as a child. And, and how that was one of the, the pain points that drove him to become a, a member of the U.S. military because he wanted to die on deployment so people would think he was worth something. And, and then go on to talk about what his time uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq did to him and what he saw and what he did and then how he got out, got into the Klan. And now this guy is is just such a force for good that I, I'm riding his coattails. <laughs> and I think that my favorite part of, of Chris's story is, first of all, it, it not only can't be discounted, is, is the bravery and the, the love that his wife showed to reach out to me for help in the first place. Uh, his wife, Melissa, she's an amazing woman. And um, nowadays... Chris and his wife, Melissa, and their little boy, CJ, and their daughter, Myra, are living in a pretty nice place. You'll recall, Nick, that the place he was living in back then, I, the way I describe it to people, I'm like a Hollywood set designer with a million dollar budget and 10 years to research could not have designed a more prototypical redneck hovel than the one that Chris Buckley lived in. Yes. Uh, he, he had a stove out in the front yard. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, shit you not. I mean, everything's like spray painted and duct taped together. Well, now they, they got a, a, a nice little place. It's clean. It's, it's a great place for the kids to live. And my favorite part about it is that, CJ is like a happy, sweet little kid. That's really good. And, to hear. and as as you know, Nick, when when we met Chris, his son CJ, you know, he's a spitting image of, uh, had his own little clan road. Mm -hmm. And one of the impetus for Melissa to contact me was that CJ would rock walk around dropping n bombs when they were at Walmart. And, and using racial slurs and saying white power. And you'll also recall, like, CJ was an angry, angry little kid. Mm -hmm. And he would just snap at the slightest provocation. He would beat the dog. He would, he was just, I was so worried about him. And nowadays, uh, I just visited him this past January. Myra's doing awesome as well. Uh, the, the kids are doing great. Chris and Melissa are doing a lot better. And just to think about, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about helping people turn their lives around so that their kids' lives can be turned around. And and to bring it all full circle, I get a, a lot of pushback from political extremes nowadays. And I get actually more pushback from the far left than I do from the far right. And a lot of their, their story is, is that uh, they're like, fuck forgiveness. Fuck kindness. We're done being kind. We're done being forgiven. Like, we're going to smash the oppressors because we've been oppressed for 500 years. And it's usually like snot-nosed white college kids saying this, but there, there's certainly people of color who, who feel that way as well. And I can't blame them one bit. Uh, I fully acknowledge that. But I, what I, I tell them is, like, do, do you want to do what it takes to prevail in this conflict? Chris, being a vet, like, taught me to think tactically. I'm like, do you want to do what it takes to prevail in the conflict and accomplish your objective? Or do you just want to be right, and and you want to feel like you know you're you're doing the right thing? That's the question you got to ask yourselves because that woman at McDonald's had no obligation to treat me with kindness. No one would have begrudged her if she'd be like, "Fuck you, Nazi! Get the fuck out of my store!" Like she had every right to do that. She had every reason to do that. But instead, she did what she had to do to prevail in that conflict, and that was disarm me with compassion and forgiveness, and kindness. And because she did that, it brought me to a place over 20-something years to where I met Chris Buckley, and I was able to help him change the course of his life, which helped to change the course of his son's life. And as you know, it ultimately led to the disbanding of an entire clan group in northern Georgia. And so that happened because of kindness. That happened because of forgiveness. That didn't happen because, of, like, smash the white supremacist capitalist oppressor. It happened because 
people had the bravery to connect with what's best about being human. And to do that, they had to set their political views aside. They had to connect on a, on a spiritual level rather than allow their, their political attachments to dictate how they're going to treat other people. And so I had some amazing teachers in my life. Without them, uh, I couldn't have done anything I've done, certainly not being successful with Chris. And I'm delighted to say Chris is doing the same thing now. He was in northern Texas on a case where the family was worried about their kid getting mixed up in white nationalism. And Chris's first, I'm talking to him, he's like, okay, I'm going to bring him to Clarkston, Georgia and introduce him to Mother Amina, who's a Somali refugee woman. <laughs> That Chris first met at going to an iftar dinner in 2017, and Chris is like, I'm going to bring this kid to the most diverse place I know and introduce him to all these amazing people who love me, who are my friends, and who I wouldn't trade for anything on earth, and who I wouldn't know if I was still attached to all my bullshit. So to, to see him keeping this this process and this like cycle of spirituality going is, is one of the greatest gifts I've ever had in my life. I think that's a beautiful tale, but that one, that one lady at McDonald's cascaded it into this network and this spider web of like little good deeds here and there that, that helped people in ways that, that you mentioned she could have never imagined, but it took that one act to start yep. it off. So Part Eep and I started an organization, actually the Part Eep and his brother and other people who had lost their, their family in the Sikh Temple shooting of August 5th, 2012, started an organization called Serve to Unite. And Part Eep and I kind of brought it into schools. And uh, right now we're um, hoping to connect with some DHS grants to kind of take it countrywide. But working with these kids, I have a workshop where I tell the McDonald's story and then we all just kind of like riff on who this woman was and, and how did she get to the point where she was so adept with kindness that she could give it to the person who least deserved it, right. but the person who needed it most and the person who it was most powerful with. And so we would kind of like write stories and draw pictures and talk about who she was and what in her life led her to that point. So if you think of that, that, that interaction as like the singularity and then everything ahead of it and everything behind it and all of those people connected you can literally see how an act of kindness can change the world and i i couldn't think of anything more exciting than that in my head i mean your, your story is really a story of humanity right it's that's that how i idea. distill it i mean it really is it's hopeful it's it, like to me i always tell people I guess professionally I've switched industries many, many times and people say, Oh, you know, why do you do that? And I'm like, because everything boils down to humanity. That's really straightforward, right? What doctors use, you know, their own terminology and in, in their hospitals in construction, we have our own little acronyms. Everyone's got like, right. The mix of DP, all these little acronyms. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's here you were trying to find identity you chose the wrong path or was it right? Or was it, or did you, you were just on a journey and the lens just had to change a few times, which led you, led you to what you're doing now, which is, which is giving people the right lens, right. And sharing your story to impact where that lens leads you. There's a beauty to that. There's a lot of bravery that you've had to have. There's a lot of just your own personal you know, I'm certainly not a therapist, but there's a lot of you looking hard at yourself and saying, mm. I want to matter. I want someone to view me for who I am, all of me. Mm. And the only way I can do that is by accepting myself, my truth. Mm. How do I go do that? And so it's, man, it's inspiring. It's fucking crazy. It's right. It's like, there's no way around that. It's crazy, but thank you. I mean, thank you for having the bravery to share your story. Thank you for leaning into so many dark places, so many unknowns, right? I mean, just the fact of you launching your, your organization, that could have went a million different ways, right? Like, <laughs> right. Who are <laughs> right. you? Like, who are you to launch this thing on an MLK day? Right? Like, right. What? but at the same time, I'm just so happy that people were receptive because it says a lot about humanity. Well, I, that, that means the world to me, Diego. And you, you, you put it so beautifully too. I, I thank you and, and Nick for uh, giving me this chance to, to share my story. 
how can we help? I mean, how, how can people help you otherwise, you know, how can we, I read the book. It's wonderful. Obviously we'll tout that. It's a great book. Um, I listened to an audible. The yeah. gift of our wounds. Yeah. Uh, people can find the book at giftofourwounds.com. There, there's links to order the book. There's also a link to something, uh, a little project we did called Gift Magazine, which uh, I share with you on our, on our YouTube channel. It started out as me just with a camera on a tripod and sitting down with people like Daryl Davis or uh, mm. Bernice King, the eldest daughter of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And just kind of say, what's the gift of your wounds? And then uh, as I emailed earlier, uh, my filmmaking career has progressed and I finally actually had a, a budget. I did a seven minute documentary about a restaurant run by Syrian refugees and uh, that came out great. It really is the opportunity to help tell these stories is something I'm so excited about. So if people buy the book, that's huge. Uh, people visit our YouTube channel, share that content, view it. That's a huge help. The organization I'm working with, Parents for Peace, is uh, I've been doing this for 10 years. And I, I've come across a lot of organizations in the counterviolent extremism space. I chose to work with Parents for Peace because I think they're the best. They do an amazing job of addressing violent extremism as a public health issue and doing it from a, a nonpartisan place, a really a spiritual place, kind of a, a condensed version of, of what I did working with Chris. And that's why Chris is a, a member of Parents for Peace now. So when people visit parentsforpeace.org with the number four, share the content that we have there, share our content from our social media assets. And of course, uh, it, it's as important as ever. I know everybody's struggling now during the time of the pandemic, but it's a society that is more ripe breeding ground for violent extremism than it's ever been before. So as we're all strapped financially, it's all the more important that organizations like Parents for Peace get financial support so that we can reach people who need help getting out of these types of movements. And, and we help people from jihadi groups get out. We help people get out of white nationalist groups. We help people get out of Antifa groups. We help people get out of all sorts of extremism. We have a, a toll-free nationwide uh, helpline at one eight four 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 nine peace that anybody looking for help can call, whether it's a parent who's concerned about a child or a loved one getting mixed up in extremism, or if it's an individual needing help directly, that's what Parents for Peace does. And uh, anybody in a position to, to support Parents for Peace financially, that's, a, that's, that's absolutely huge. And you're working on something, right? Are you working on a script? You started at the beginning. You said you're working on something. Tell us a little bit about that. I am. I read Save the Cat. What more do you mm. need to know than to write a screenplay? <laughs> the quintessential <So> I, <laughs> screenwriting book. <laughs> I, I read it and then promptly like shit canned everything in it because my script is not following all the steps they so nicely give you. But at the end of February this year, I started writing the screenplay for The Gift of Our Wounds. And I just really fell in love with the, the screenwriting process and the format. And it's uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Last question for you. Yeah. What do you want to be remembered for? Or who do you want to be remembered as? Uh, I, I really, I, I, my, my tattoo I just got that you see here is a, a symbol from Siki. It's called Ekon Kar. And it's uh, the, the first uh, words in the, the sixth scripture. So even though I'm a Buddhist, I, I'm now very inspired by spirituality of all kinds and especially inspired by Sikhi, having known Pardeep and having seen the Sikh community demonstrate something called Chardikala. And what Chardikala translates as loosely is a uh, rising spirit or relentless optimism. And it's the, the concept that no matter what's happening in our lives, it's a divine creation and it's something to be grateful for. Mm. And I, you know, it's easy to be grateful when things are going great. It's difficult to be grateful during a pandemic. It's difficult to be grateful when your father was just murdered along with six other people at, at your place of worship on a beautiful sunny Sunday morning. But I've seen party do this. I've seen all kinds of people in the Sikh community exhibit what Chardikala means. And to me, that is the ultimate defiance of hate and violence. 
That's the ultimate, like, fuck you, you're not breaking us. You're not going to make us lose our faith in humanity as you've lost yours. As a matter of fact, because of your violence, I'm going to have more faith in humanity than I ever did. Because I saw how all these communities from southeastern Wisconsin gathered to come together and support the sick community that they didn't even know existed before. Like, I've seen people whose parents have been murdered say, I forgive the, the guy who killed my dad, and I do it with vengeance. Like, that's my mm. jam. That's my groove. That's why I get We Are One tattooed on my fist. So I think, it, to answer that question, I think I want to be remembered as a rebel. I, I want to be remembered as, as someone who acted in, in defiance, but in defiance of hate and violence through love and through compassion and kindness and, and what's best about being a human being. I love that, brother. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Thank man. you so much, oh, Arno. Thank you. Thanks. I, I love you guys. We hope you enjoy that episode, and we hope you come away with a new understanding of how to fight back against the hatred out there in the world. We'd love to know your thoughts on it, so reach out to us at Startup a Storefront on any social media platform or on our website, StartupStorefront.com. The Startup a Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Megan Conrad, Haley Nelson, Owen Capellini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. We've got more great episodes coming out every week, so if you aren't already, consider subscribing. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Startup the Storefront. Because in case you didn't know, we film all of our episodes and release them a day early on YouTube. And you can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes, available wherever you get your podcasts, and on our website, StartupStorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.